Welcome back to Historical Light, an independent Masonic show focused on the historical events and aspects within Freemasonry. As always, I'm your host, Brother Alex Powers. Thank you all for joining us again. Uh, past master at Gardner Lodge, district deputy of 9A. Uh, we also have with us our co-host, Brother Robert Marshall. Uh, Robert, if you don't mind, you'll introduce yourself. Greetings, folks. Glad to be back. Uh, uh, Robert Marshall, as always, I'm still here chained to my desk in Waco Masonic Lodge. Uh, where I'm a past master, current secretary, uh, I'm a past district education officer, and uh, serving with Alex uh, as a deputy director of Kansas Lodge Research. Oh, yes, I forgot to mention the KSLOR this time. Well, I got it, so you don't get to now. Well, there you go. Stealing my thunder as always, Robert. Thank you. And then we're uh, very lucky to have with us tonight, Brother Justin Jones. Did I say that right? Yes. Uh, brother, thank you so much for joining this evening. If you don't mind, go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit about you. Sure. Well, my name is Justin Jones. Like you just said, I am a past master of Grandview Masonic Lodge number 266 and Whitney Masonic Lodge number 355. I am also the content creator for Masonic Improvement which is a uh, blog and YouTube channel geared towards what, just what it sounds like, trying to improve Masonic Lodges. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, Brother Jones, what is it that brought you into Freemasonry in the first place? Uh, I grew up with it. My dad, um, he wasn't really very vocal about it or anything, but there was, you know, square and compass things laying around the house, you know, so I'd ask questions and I knew he was a Freemason and when I got out of the Air Force, I don't know, it just seemed natural to, to gravitate towards something, you know, I can be involved, you know, with other men and things like that. And so I asked my dad about it. And of course, you know, he, he directed me to it. And what I didn't know at the time was that my, my grandfather, who 96 years old, still alive, uh, was also a Freemason at the same lodge. So um, I don't know, it just, that, that, that's what really pulled me towards it. I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot about, you know, the, the esoteric concepts. I didn't realize that was even part of Freemasonry or anything like that. Uh, this was about the time National Treasure and everything came out. So I, I, I knew there was some kind of mystery associated with it, or I thought there was, you know. And that plus the family tradition is really, I think, what, what drew me the most towards it. I wanted to be a part of something First of all, that my granddad and my dad had been involved with, but also part of something that was old and respectable and frankly, you know, had some air of mystery to it because that's very appealing to me. Yeah, definitely. I can, I can totally relate with that. I've got family history and masonry as well. Um, you know, on, on my case, it was a little different because I knew about the family history, but I didn't know enough about masonry itself to really make that connection enough to care about it. And it wasn't until, you know, years down the road, meeting my father-in-law, um, that I started seeing those neat aspects of masonry that then kind of connected the dots to that family history that made it all the more appealing. Um, so with having that family history, knowing the craft to be what it was or what it was when you joined that aspect of it, do you think you would have still been drawn to Freemasonry had you no uh, family history there? You know, that's a, that's a, I haven't considered that. I would almost say probably not. And that's simply because I was made aware of it, you know, through my dad growing up. You know, sure. so it was it was something I was that was on my mind, you know, off and on. But it's hard to say for sure. You know, who knows? I might have seen something that came up, you know, some alternate timeline where dad never joined or my granddad never joined. I still might have seen something that, that drew me to it. But just with everything the way it is now, I, I, I don't know. I, I would lean towards no, but it's hard to say. Yeah, no, that that's a good point. You know, it's it's kind of one of those things that uh, – like I said, I, I didn't know enough about what it was um, to even have it on my mind. But as soon as my father-in-law started talking about it, it's like it was everywhere. I'd, I'd notice it on TV. I'd notice symbols on cars. I'd hear people talk about it. It's just, it's kind of like when my wife bought a car and we, we hadn't seen anyone drive that car before. But as soon as we get it home, good Lord, everyone in the state owns that car. It's just, it's funny how that pops up. But I'm kind of in the same boat. I, I question if it would have caught my attention without the personal connection. You know, 
that kind of has something to say about how we're getting our message out there as well. Well, I say that, but you know, there was a, there was a period of time when I was much younger, you know, I, I was a big fan of some of the, uh, I'll, I'll be honest, some of the conspiracy things out there, not necessarily about Freemasonry, but you can't read about a conspiracy without Freemasonry coming up. So it definitely would have crossed my path. And, you know, I never believed any of the garbage about Freemasonry that, that they portray, but that might have been enough to get my interest going. Again, sure. it's hard to say though. Robert, what about you? Do you, do you think if you didn't have the family connections in it, do you think it would have still crossed your path? So I've got kind of a funny case, personally. Uh, I do have a lot of family ties, but most of them I discovered after becoming a Freemason. Right. Uh, so the primary relevance of Freemasonry to me as a, as a young man uh, was national treasure uh, or that kind of stuff. And as, as a person who was naturally inclined towards the study of history, uh, there was a great appeal in that for me, uh, but uh, it, it's hard to say. You know, my great grandfather uh, passed away, and then my great grandmother passed away, and I got their furniture, their bedroom furniture, a bicentennial furniture set. And uh, we, I think we've talked about this before on here, but there was a secret mm -hmm. rotating drawer in his dresser with Masonic uh, coins and pins and a Scottish Rite patent. And uh, I was like, "Whoa, what is this? A pocket watch? All kinds of cool stuff." Uh, and so that made me look into it, but if I, if I'm truly honest, I, I don't know if it was more the national treasure stuff or more the desire to establish a connection with my deceased grand, great grandparents that uh, really pulled me into it. It's definitely a combination of both. It's hard for me to separate. Yeah. You know, Robert, who, who doesn't find a secret compartment in a desk? full of Masonic stuff and want to look more into it, you know, that's, especially after watching National Treasure. It's like, whoa, you're onto something. Yeah, exactly. It was like, oh, that that's not just a fictional story. <laughs> right. Well, especially around the timing of that movie. I mean, that movie was kind of everything, right? I mean, that that brought it to the the mainstream for the people that don't do the the reading or the research. It, it put it in that, uh, that media eye for everybody and really like, ooh. And, you know, that's one of those things. And you start catching it different places and see the relevancy there. So, Robert, you said you obtained the furniture. Do you still have that? I do. It's still my bedroom furniture. A bicentennial set, little American colonial soldiers are the lining inside the furniture. And uh, yep, still got it. Secret rotating drawer and all. That is awesome. I totally expect a, uh, a video of that at some point in the future. <laughs> we can make that happen. That's awesome. You, you don't see those anymore, man. That, that's cool. So... Yeah. I get, you didn't, you didn't know them personally or I, I can't yeah, remember the story. Yeah. So uh, it's funny uh, because like I said, I don't think I was very consciously aware of any Masonic influence through my family, but after becoming a Mason, I was in a certain part of a degree when uh, I had a memory of my great grandfather sitting me underneath uh, three pomegranate trees that he planted back in the sixties and telling me uh, uh, the importance of understanding uh, uh what it means to, to, to have blessings from God and uh, right. to uh, what plentifulness uh, means if you've got it and what you're supposed to do with it and uh, uh, just different stories like that uh, that he told me that obviously gained significance for me and meaning after I became a Mason. Uh, but sure. a National Treasure came out. I think I was 13 years old. So I was <laughs> right for uh, – Robert. It, <laughs> I was ripe for it taking a hold of me and, and uh, uh, establishing an interest. And uh, Justin said something. I, I, I don't know y'all's age, but I consider y'all to be at, at the very least in the same Masonic generation as me. And Justin, you said something at the very beginning of this already that um, uh, the mystery appealed to you. And I think uh, historically over the last 50, 60 years, Freemasonry has consciously and intentionally tried to step away from that mystery, erase it. Uh, I actually had a guy just today, a candidate who stopped by the, the lodge and say something along the lines of, you know, I, I thought y'all were a secret organization, but my friend told me that y'all don't have any secrets and that you're right here in the public. And, and I was like, well, that's, 
that's really not true. That's that's part of a, I think, a unfortunate PR campaign that was well-meaning mm -hmm. uh, and has could potentially, as per your proof, Justin, could potentially lead to the lack of interest by guys who uh, would otherwise have been interested. Well, not to sideline everything, but since you point, you hit on that. Look at that open house program that we've had. That that I feel is in su such stark contrast to even some of the lessons you learned during the age group, during your, your catechisms and everything. You know, you're taking these people and just showing everything to them, explaining everything to them. There's no mystery to it. There's it's it's so tr it's so transparent that why would you want to join if you know everything? It's already there. If you just explain it to them, and it, it, yeah. And I'm I will sound negative saying this, but it reeks of desperation. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, I would definitely agree. You know, I, I think honestly, a lot of that is still the the whole uh, Morgan case lingering on through history. Uh, you know, after that whole fiasco went down, you, you kind of see the, the face of masonry changing in that aspect and where it was before with esoterics and, and knowledge and stuff. It was, no, no, no. Hey, we're, we're good people. Look at us. You know, we do, we do charity. This is what we're all about. And mm -hmm. the whole aspect changed. And while it's teeter tottered over the year, uh, years, um, it, it still kind of defaults back to that um, because especially in today's age with the, uh, the internet being at our fingertips and everything and giving you more crap, than useful information. Um, Freemasonry fights that more than ever, I think. So it's, it's always that default of no, no, we're good people um, versus the experience, I guess, is what really lacks at the end of the day. Exactly. Yeah. I think we're all on the same page there. Well, Brother Justin, um, we had you on today because you've, you've got kind of an interesting story. So you came into Freemasonry expecting something as we all do, that, that lure that we've spoke of here. Um, and within that, you fell a little bit short of the expectations that you were looking for, and you actually left the craft. Uh, I want to see if you'll talk to us a little bit about what was going through your mind when you came in, what caused you to leave, and and why you came back and, you know, where, where you're kind of going from that point. Um, in comparison, basically what we want to touch on is we do history on this show. We see in the, in the history of Freemasonry how it was huge and such a deep aspect of so many lives. And that number is dwindling today. Um, and the people that take it as serious as some is even a smaller number. Um, so I'd like to compare what, what you think – was that precedent in those times versus today that, you know, kind of makes those changes? Sure. Uh, I'll just start off with the story and I'll, I'll go from there. So, you know, how I came to join the fraternity, I've already explained that, you know, just yeah. kind of what, what attracted me to it, what drew me and all that. Um, so I, when, when you think of Freemasonry, especially particularly, I guess, as a non, non Mason, you have a certain, mental image of the fraternity and it some things may be inaccurate that happens anytime you're looking at any organization there's always there's always some things that you will be wrong with and some things that you you could, should reasonably expect to see and basically what happened from the moment i walked into my first lodge room um that, you know the first time i went to the lodge and started meeting the brothers and everything is these these ideas that I had in my mind just kind of started to to shatter you know one after another you know the state of the lodge you know the transparency I mean they showed me everything right from the beginning the, the the dues were so cheap the degree fees were so cheap uh it was not hard to get into uh, I was one of those guys and you hear about this they'll go to a lodge and they'll sit down with you right there two or three guys they'll ask you a few questions and you're, you're gold. They'll build on you the next meeting. That's that's your investigation. That's your get to know you period and everything. It happens right there the first time you come in. And granted, I did have a step up because, like I said, my family was from that community. Um, they they knew my family really well and everything. So that's I'm no doubt that's a factor into how fast it was for me to get in. But I was expecting something more difficult. I expected some kind of more rigorous vetting process. I didn't expect it to be so cheap. I, you know, I thought there was going to be some mystery. I didn't know they were going to walk me through the entire building and show me, you know, everything there was. And so, like little things like that, one by one, these, these, these 
mental images I had just kind of, you know, just shattered away. They went away. And I don't know. So I went through degrees and I had really good degrees, you know, for what I knew at the time. And I still think today they're pretty good degrees. But, you know, and I, I, did, I did the questions and the answers. I learned all the memory work and everything. It's just like I was supposed to. And there wasn't really emphasis on actually learning the work so much as memorizing the words. So I went through all this. I, I, I did the process. I, I did everything there was to do. And during the time that I was actually going through the degrees, you know, it was very structured. You know, you need to learn this. You need to learn this. This, this is what you're going to turn in. And that was really good. I, I enjoyed that structure. And once I got done with my master's degree, you know, I turned in my work and everything. And that's it. You know, it's just like, well, what do I do now? What should I work on? And everyone says, well, at this point, you just get out what you put into it. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I, I hate that. I hate that. So that's a cop out. I hate it so mm -hmm. much. And um, so I was like, okay, whatever. And so I'm kind of aimless in the fraternity. I don't really know what I should be working on, who I should, you know, where should my goals be? What should I be doing? And the lodge I was a member of at the time, they were they were downtown. They're still downtown, but it's it's one of those situations where, based off, I don't know that I don't know the technical aspects of it, but basically based off where they are, the electric bill is outrageous, kind of thing, because you know they're not using it at a steady rate, so they have to have higher rates, and it. It's an older building. It was built in the 60s, so it had all kinds of maintenance problems. And long story short, uh, to keep the lodge functioning in this building, they were, had to rely on fundraising. And they had a fundraiser that came through town twice a year. It was like a, it was like a countywide flea market, and it went right by the front door of the lodge. So they would uh, cook a whole bunch of barbecue, sit up front of the lodge, and sell it twice a year. And I noticed pretty quickly that that was what most of our meetings consisted of, you know, planning for a barbecue, running the barbecue, or talking about how well the barbecue went. And then once you got done talking about how well it went, guess what? It's time to find a new one. So it just kept going on and on and on. And, you know, it was I just like my second barbecue. It did not take long for me to just to, Get tired of this you know and um i'm helping out I'm, I'm doing you know doing volunteer work which i have no problem with doing charity i have no problem with service you know but if that's all i wanted to do i want to join the lions club or something and so i'm doing all this stuff and it's just like this is all we're doing you know it's just it's just like a glorified service organization and at that point you know i, I finished my day and then i just kind of i kind of stopped going you know, my, my, my dad, my granddad, they would get me to come eventually. But, you know, I show up every two or three months and you're still talking about the same crap they were when I left. I wasn't missing anything. And so I just, I just stopped coming. And um, what got me back, what got me back in fraternity was something always didn't sit right with me because why... Why is there so much ritual? Why is there so much memory work? Why is so much pop and, and, and ceremony just to sell barbecue? You know, and, and so it's like there was like a, a conflict with what we were actually doing and what it seemed like we were supposed to actually be doing. And I, I started doing research. I got online. I found a few websites, uh, found some found some good PDFs, eventually got some books, and I realized I was not far off. We were we were like in this like the stage of state of denial where it's it's like here's what you're supposed to be doing this is what we built and but this is what we're actually going to go do and once I realized I wasn't the only person that saw this once I realized that there's people that had issue with the same thing and and foremost once I realized that the way I thought we were supposed to be doing it wasn't far off. I, I, I came back and that's that was one of the big reasons I started the Masonic recruitment uh, there were some other things that led up to it but eventually that's what eventually led me to starting the website is is I got to put all this all these ideas in one place I mean they're all online nothing I've ever said on my on my website is unique it's nothing no original content it's just you know because it's all over the internet but this is just me taking the ideas and putting it in one place 
Um, what was your, you had another question that kind of relates to that. Uh, well, just how, kind of, yeah, just kind of, you know, historically how, how masonry was perceived in those days and carried out versus today that can kind of lead to that same aspect that that loss of uh, whatever you want to call it, so to speak. Could, could I could I kind of piggyback on that question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, did you have an idea of Freemasonry that either at that time or since then? you've understood to have been an actual historical reality for Freemasonry that was no longer the case. And, and you were disappointed by the fact that what you got in the present day did not match up with what Freemasonry was. Sure. I could, I can, uh, and I, I feel like I'm in a pretty unique situation because uh, my granddad, I mean, he's, you don't usually see this in men as old as he is. But and it sounds callous, but I mean, he's 96 years old. I can be pretty, I can be pretty blunt about it. Usually when men get that age, they, their, their mental facilities kind of start to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. and, and my granddad is still a really sharp guy. And he went through the degrees back in like the 40s. So my perspective, you know, he loves to talk about Freemasonry. So I, I know, I have a really good idea of what he went through at that time. And I can tell you, and I'll give specific examples if you want Actually, I was going to read it because it kind of ties into the other question. But I can tell you that the, the, the expectations for joining, uh, the, the bar for membership itself has dropped. Wrong. And, and I, I, wish I, I wish I was able to participate during a time when, when the focus was on quality instead of just pushing as many people through. Yeah. But um, just to just to give like historic examples, and they'll tie in to kind of what my story, how my story goes, is like I said, my granddad he joined back in the '40s, and he and another guy petitioned the lodge at the same time, and this was both the first time for both of them to petition, and they both got a black ball, or black cube, or whatever you want to call it, and. My granddad, you know, he was talking to this buddy of his, I guess it was a buddy, it was, it, you know, this guy petitioned at the same time. And, you know, he's like, are you going to repetition? Because they both got three cubes, so they had to wait three years. And mm -hmm. this other guy, he's like, no, screw those guys. I mean, they don't want me in. I'm not going to have anything to do with them. And, you know, my granddad's mentality was, well, I'll be petitioning as soon as I can. And if I still don't get in, by the time I die, there's going to be a petition on that secretary's desk. <laughs> so that, that showed the difference within the, the dedication to actually join the fraternity. And I'm not suggesting by any means that would that any lodge do this because what the practice was is anytime someone petitioned a lodge for the first time, regardless of who they were, they got cubed out. They didn't get in. And this was, this was part of their process to, to kind of weed out people that weren't genuinely interested join the fraternity because you gotta you gotta keep in mind aside from you know quality control this was a time you know really kind of before social security and, and a lot of a lot of the uh the, the uh, social safety nets that we have now were in place and communities were smaller people were you know they're more tight-knit and so as a freemason you i mean that obligation to look out for your brothers it was a big deal because you know, they didn't have social security when they retired or anything like that necessarily. If they fell on hard times, it was your job as a brother to take care of them. So they want to be very careful about who they let in because you don't want somebody, you don't want to let someone in. And then a week later, like, oh, I can't work anymore. You guys got to help me out. And not only that, but it, it, it made it more prestigious because it was harder to get into. Now, Contrast that to now, like I was, like I mentioned earlier, with um, you know, so many lodges, a guy can come in off the street, and I'm not picking on anybody, but a guy can come in off the street, say he wants to join, and he can leave that day with a fully signed petition with guys that he'd never met before. And what happens is that is that at that point, 
when you just let anybody in, a lodge is only as strong as its lowest common denominator. And, yeah. and that's not a very popular idea because back, back in the day, it seemed like there was this mentality where we're only going to let people, it's, let me back up, it's a reverse mentality. The mentality now is we'll just throw everyone at the wall and see what sticks, right? And the mentality back in the day was we're gonna have this really strict uh, barrier to entry and unfortunately, not all good men will probably breach that barrier, but this is going to make it harder for unworthy people to join. And I say that because, you know, I've talked about this before, and men that I know are good have told me, well, I wouldn't have joined if I had got blackballed. I would never have come back. And, and I understand that mentality. I really do. I, honestly, I don't know if I would have come back. But the men... But you got to look at it two ways. What's better for the fraternity? You know, what's better? Is it letting everybody in and hoping that the good people stick around and, and the people that aren't really worthy for the fraternity just kind of hopefully go away? Or keep that barrier high and maybe not everybody will come back, but at least you're, at least you're kind of ensuring that those people that don't necessarily be, need to be in the fraternity are in it. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh, crud, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> well, in that train of thought, uh, knowing we were going to talk about this a little bit, I pulled out some minutes. And uh, obviously, this is a very limited perspective, right? One lodge, random lodge, one random set of minutes, and literally open uh, to one random page. Wow. <laughs> uh, and this is uh, the 1920 to 1933 minutes. This is July 16th, 1920, random page. Uh, at this stated meeting, 26 petitions were received, 20 were uh, elected to receive the degrees, and six were rejected. That's a 30% rejection rate. So, wow. uh, uh, and, and I've seen statistics across uh, the country corresponding to that rate from the 19, from about 1900 uh, on until the 30s and 40s, where about one in three guys got blackballed. Uh, and that's what you're talking about here. Uh, there is uh, demonstrable historic evidence that uh, we weren't letting everybody in. Mm -hmm. And um, I'll get this is kind of difficult to talk about because you're kind of opening the opening the jar for. <laughs> uh, this is kind of a generational difference, I think. You have um, you have a certain generation. I'll just be honest. And, and I know I'm painting with a wide brush here. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to, you know, pigeonhole anybody into certain yeah. characteristics, but it's, There's the, exceptions. it's the boomers, right? They, they got into fraternity. <laughs> it's, it's what it is. Here they, we go. I'm pointing fingers. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they'll say the same thing about us. So it's fair. That's fair enough. Yeah. But you know, you, you had this, and if you look at like uh, the numbers, the graphs of, of the membership numbers across the United States. I mean, that's, that's who was coming in during that giant swell, you know, that's, that's the boomers. And they really, they didn't really want to hurt anyone's feelings. And you can still see that today. So I know that's what the case was because they, they really don't want to do or say anything that might hurt somebody's feelings and make them not want to join. And so when, when these guys came in in huge numbers, they had totally different, totally different idea of how they wanted the fraternity to run than the predecessors. And they joined in such large numbers that they created change in the fraternity that, and a lot of that changed kind of what I was talking about when I came in that contrasted with my expectations. <laughs> I'm being very cautious here was uh was implemented by them and this kind of ties into what i think the difference is because when they joined they had they were looking for very different things in fraternity and it offered things that were very different in terms of relevance mm -hmm. to what we're looking for now in younger generations mm -hmm. uh and you could you could see that and because the, the proof is in the pudding because they had the majority 
membership of every lodge, right? And so the programs, and every Grand Lodge too, by the way. And so the programs you see today are what they implemented, right? So these lodges that focus heavily on uh, charity work and, and, you know, raising money and turning around and giving it away, uh, these lodges or Grand Lodges that focus on transparency and making it making it easier, making it more accessible, removing anything scary from the fraternity. That was the boomers. And and it's it's not necessary. I'm not trying to pick on them, but since we had a whole generation pretty much skip out of the fraternity, these guys were in charge for a very long time, much longer than most generations are usually in charge of the fraternity. So what we see now is the byproduct of, of, of that generational gap with the boomers being in charge yeah. and and again like i said i'm not we, we 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 do owe the boomers a great deal of gratitude because there are so many lodges now that would not still be sitting if it was not for these guys sitting in these empty lodges honestly fudging the, the minutes in some cases to make it look like there was enough people to join so that future generations would have something that they could be a part of and so we owe them gratitude. I'm not, I'm not saying that they ruined the fraternity or anything. They, they kept us going when no one else would. But what I am saying is what was relevant to them is very relevant uh, or very different in relevance to what we're looking for now. Yeah. I guess, I guess where I would hop in, and I, I'm right there with you on a lot of that. Um, I guess where I would have to kind of give benefit of the doubt to the boomers is kind of what I touched on before, after we see with the whole uh, Morgan case where the, the platform of masonry is presented to the public in a different manner. Um, you know, the boomers come in in a generation where there's just, you know, they're booming. There's, there's just a ton of people. But they came in after the aspect where that, that Masonic connection had been rebranded to society at a whole. Well, then the boomers come in and it's a generation of joiners. There's all these different things to join and it's, it's a membership drive like you've never seen before. So, I mean, I think we see it on, on a bigger scale from them because there was more of them. There was, I mean, it was a spike in the bar graph, right? Mm -hmm. But they're also taking what was kind of set up to them. It's like they're dealt mm -hmm. a bad hand in a way. Because I honestly think like, you know, if, and it would probably have been something else, but historically, if the Morgan event had not happened, the Grand Lodges had not shut down, uh, masonry kept on how it was, I think it would have, it would have kept a different face um, that they would have been handling at that point. So it's kind of like, you know, when, once it gets tilted in that direction, it starts magnifying and magnifying and becoming more and more that. Mm -hmm. And that it, it kind of touches on a point that, that Robert brought up um, about, comparing masonry or wanting masonry to be what it was versus what it is. And you know, that, that is a hard one for me to grasp because I, I've had this conversation with guys several times um, just because of the fact of, yeah, you know, I'm a, I'm a history guy. I'm obsessed with what masonry was where I struggle it with is saying that masonry is different because people treat it differently. You know, I, I see certain things that I'm like, I don't care that that that's not masonry you know that's that's not the point here so that's that that whole you know what it is versus what it was that's a struggle with me um i don't know what what's your guys's take on that uh i've had a couple of thoughts while both of y'all are talking about these things one is a, a very particular uh thought that i've only i guess recently really kind of uh, solidified in understanding and it's a difference in the understanding of the phrase peace and harmony in freemasonry uh, in the late 1800s, if you look through Masonic books and uh, minutes, uh, especially proceedings of Grand Lodges across the country, the phrase was very commonly used to refer to instances where uh, uh, things like rejections were coming up or uh, uh, expulsions and suspensions. And, and what was being said at that time was, uh, for the sake of peace and harmony, peace and harmony being important in a lodge, uh, we need to uh, uh, face these differences in our expectations for Freemasonry and uh, keep these um, uh, differing elements out. Uh, so uh, it was stuff like uh, guys, you know, maybe it would have been in charity or 
basically they were they were head on addressing disagreement uh, and, and and trying to clear the lodge of problems it had to establish uh, peace and harmony, but they weren't necessarily ignoring problems or refusing to discuss them. Uh, whereas today, over and over and over, I've always seen across the country, anytime an argument starts to come up, guys will shut it down by saying, peace and harmony, peace and harmony. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, if this is going to be something we're going to disagree about, let's just not talk about it so that we can have some peace and harmony. And that's just not the classical understanding of what harmony was. Well, sometimes the conversations you have to have are the hard ones. Yeah. And I know, I, tell, I know exactly what you're talking about, Robert, because I see it all the time. Instead of just, you know, being a man and being able to agree to disagree on something, we just avoid the situation altogether yeah. and not have any conversations. Well, hell, that's why you see lodges with dues from 50 years ago still today, you know, because no one ever wanted to bring it up because no one wants to start a fight. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I, that came to mind while both of you were talking is another new thing I've kind of solidified, and that's where... Uh, since we picked on boomers, I'm going to pick on my peers, uh, where millennial Masons have really latched on to this idea of blaming boomer Masons for the problems in Masonry. <laughs> uh, and I'm not picking on <laughs> you. Uh, statistically, I can, I, can, I can find where certain elements of a decline in Freemasonry began before the boomers were even Masons. Yeah. And that they were inheriting a certain kind of, uh, Alex referred to it as joiner masonry, a watered down version uh, in, in such a way that there's not a guy alive today who uh, remembers Freemasonry when it was at its more or less peak, if you will, with uh, uh, percentage of masons per capita instead of just total numbers, because, uh, you know, we call them boomers, the, the boomer population uh, skews the numbers in a lot of ways to make it look like masonry is peaking later than it did. Uh, so you go all the way back to the 1920s, late teens, when it really, truly peaked. And uh, it gets more interesting, because in the late 1800s across the country, you can see minutes and speeches and newspapers where guys are talking about our order is almost dead. We're, we're, running out of, we're running out of masons. This thing's about to collapse. And then within 20 years, they're reaching their biggest peak of all time at 1919. Uh, so something was going on there between 1890 and 1920 that caused uh, an increase in literature and poetry and Masonic music and uh, study of sciences and education programs galore. You think we have uh, a bunch of education programs happening today. Look at the 19 teens minutes. They had education programs happening weekly, sometimes daily, where lodges were open six days a week, 10 hours a day. Uh, and the guest speakers. And of course, the, the, the big uh, advent for all of that was uh, the establishment of full-time paid grand lecturers in various jurisdictions in the mid-1800s allowing the first real formalization of ritual, uh, the first formalization of esoteric teachings, and all the kind of stuff that you're seeing millennials crave. Mm -hmm. uh, the boomers never had it. It's not that they threw away education or they started lowering standards. It's that the standards were lowered when they got there. And so now you've got a case where uh, the numbers of the 40s and 50s caused the boomers to come in at a time where it appeared Freemasonry was at its peak. It appeared that we were operating on all cylinders when the decline had already begun. Mm -hmm. And so these guys have now been 40, 50 years deep into thinking they remember when everything was at its best. And then the, the, the historical record actually shows that they weren't even alive when it was at its best. Uh, and so... Uh, the, the bone I would pick there with millennials uh, is one that I was guilty of for a long time and pointing the finger at boomers. It's not their fault. Uh, and, 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 and we can see evidence of it. Uh, all three of us, I imagine, in bringing education programs, uh, Justin, you talked about how at your lodge, it was a barbecue lodge. I call it fish fry Freemasonry, right? Uh, where nobody really knows what we're supposed to do. So we're going to busy ourselves with fish fry. Uh, yeah. Uh, when you bring education into lodges like that, or you talk about Masonic history, 
you, you, you walk in with a book. Oh, gosh, let those guys see a new Masonic book. Those boomers, they love that stuff. It's just not something that was ever really uh, made available to them when they came in and learned Masonry. Uh, so we have to, I, th I, I think, the most important thing we can do is there is a gap that Justin referred to, the lost generation of Masons between boomers and millennials. Uh, bridge that gap. And the only way we're going to bridge that gap is getting the existing boomers right now on board with the direction with millennials. And it's going to be doing things like what we're talking about here, uh, looking at the history of Freemasonry and uh, figuring out what sorts of things appeal to all of us and build on some kind of common ground. Yeah. I just want to, I want to clarify something real quick, if I, if I may. Uh, just, just, just to be, you know, totally clear. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not bashing boomers at all. No, no. Y'all no, no. you know, know that. I know y'all know that. Just, just to kind of clarify for your audience and everything. Um, you know, I, I was just pointing out. You know, due to that gap, I feel like a lot of the programs we have today mm -hmm. are the result of you know them being in charge for a long time. It's not necessarily. I mean, it's them implementing what they want to see in the fraternity, what they think is best for the fraternity. I'm not suggesting, you know, anything negative. And what's really interesting about what you're saying about that gap, Robert is like my granddad will tell he'll basically when after he, after he got in you know the focus and you could tell just from listening was was on the ritual you know learning the work and everything and that that's what was important you know mm -hmm. learning the work getting it as perfect as you can putting on the you know putting on degrees the best you can you won't hear him talk about education or anything like that in the lodge and so that really ties in to what you're saying is you know they inherited kind of this watered down freemasonry they still had certain practices in place you know such as guarding the gate and everything but uh they didn't quite know what to do with it you know so it was like well we have this ritual let's just get this ritual really really on point but being a generation of joiners you know these guys they weren't just in freemasonry they were in you know lions club and rotary and elks lodge and, and whatever and, and so when the question comes up, well, what do we do with Freemasonry? Because it's so different than everything else. Well, let's let's just run it like the other organizations that we yeah. are in part that, that we're involved with so heavily. And so, so that's why my theory it's my theory anyway, why Freemasonry looks a lot like other organizations, such as Lions Club, where you have this this basically in most lodges is a service organization, but you have this out of place uh, framework around it where you have to go through these degrees and, and memorize these things that really have nothing to do with how well you can fry fish. And so you never <laughs> touch on it again. And, and I think with younger men, I think that's why you, I think that's where you lose them right there because you, it's not authentic feeling, you know, why do we learn all these things if we're never going to talk about it again, if we're never going to touch on it anymore, unless we're just putting on a degree so, so we could sell fish or barbecue or raffle guns, you know? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I, I think that's, that's a big factor. I think that's why there's a hole in the bucket for so many Grand Lodges. And, and the reaction, you know, the knee jerk reaction of these, of these people that are in charge is to keep implementing the things that they want to see in fraternity that they try to put their, themselves in our shoes. And so they're implementing things that they think that we would like to see. But unfortunately, it's sharp contrast to anything that if, if anyone would just ask, <laughs> it'd yeah. be a sharp contrast to what they're trying to implement. Yeah, the big fallacy you hear on, uh, a lot in lodges traveling around the country uh, is but well, we can't get any young guys to join because all they want to do is be on Facebook or social media. And that's how they get their interaction. And, and the reason I call it a fallacy is because that's exactly why young men do want Freemasonry is because they're so used to getting their social interaction through impersonal means. And Freemasonry offers that one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, real life interaction that they crave. Uh, so, uh, yeah. If we can get away from the kind of cop outs, which, you know, saying that young men just want social media, it, it's a cop out uh, that me, I, I'm sure they believe, but still a cop out. And the other cop out you mentioned already, which I love that you put out there 
is uh, you get out of it what you put into it. And uh, that was something that I repeated for years as a young Mason. And yeah. one day it just dawned on me that it was exactly what you call it, a cop-out, in that it, it gives active Masons, the guys running the lodge, it gives them the easy exit button on a new member because guy comes in, in your case, you get a guy, a young guy who comes in uh, looking for whatever it was you were looking for. You didn't find it, so you left. And so now they get to say, well, he didn't put anything into us. He's gone. So if you get out of it, what you put into it, bye. Yeah. Uh, and, and what needs to be understood, I think, is if you're going to buy into that mentality, if we're going to continue the motto of you get out of it, what you put into it, I'm not sure that it's even possible to take that out of Freemasonry anymore. Uh, if you're going to have that, you have to add on a clause. And the clause you have to add is a lodge will get out of a man what a lodge puts into that man. Oh, uh, so, that you, so that you have shared responsibility. Uh, it, it can't be a one-way thing and put it all on that poor guy who doesn't even know what masonry is when he arrives. Uh, it's it's got to be a two-way street. And it has no, has no direction once he turns it off his work. Yeah, exactly. You know, you pin into it. Well, I don't even know where to go to put anything in at, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. No, that's that. That's a stellar comment, Robert. Because I, you know, I'm personally guilty of that as well. Those those words have came off my lips too many times. Um, but yeah, to get out of the man what you put into him that that is that I love that. That's great. Before we jump too far, the random thought on my mind, and I don't want to let it slip away. Can you grab that minute book you had? Sure. Trust. That's so a little hot rating for Robert right there. But hold that sucker up. <laughs> Holy crap. <laughs> wow. Dude, that is a monster. <laughs> 13 years of craft uh, from 1920 to 1933, during which time our average number of new members per year was around 730. Woo. Wow. So I, I guess what, what really caught my, my mind there, my eye, um, was, you know, obviously I just, I just finished that book and went through all of our minute books and we have books that have 13 years in them and they are less than half that size. And one of the points I touched on in the book is freaking write the minutes. Yeah. You know, like minutes are, oh yeah, Joe and Tom and Greg were here. We opened and closed. What? That's not the only thing they did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, the minutes when it comes down to it are, are history and uh, seeing a book that big is just like, thank you. Cause you know, they actually wrote stuff. They documented history in there. That, that's fantastic. So but anyways, I just, I wanted to, I wanted to point that out cause that was a, uh, yeah, that was phenomenal to see. One of the things we talked about was, you know, seeing, seeing the size of the craft um, kind of fade over the years. But one thing that always catches, catches my attention looking back and, I hate to even uh, even mention this because I can't say exactly for sure what book it was or when or where at. I want to say it's in Pike's Esoterica, but it blew my mind. I'm reading through it. It was it was Pike for sure. I just can't remember which book, but we're talking about Pike's, you know, 1800s, and he mentions in Lodge the exact same issues we see now. That you know mm -hmm. maybe 20 percent showing up, and out of that maybe a couple that are even into the esoterics or know what the heck it is. Mm -hmm. And when I read that, it blew my mind. Cause I had this, you know, connotation of the past and just, you know, it's dream masonry. And you read that and it's like, Holy crap. It's always been this way. Yep. <laughs> and it, you know, it puts it into a, a whole different perspective there, but yeah. I, I think, and this is just something I, I, I toss around in my head sometimes. But I, I, I think, you know, the, the true, what I would consider to be true Freemasonry, you know, like, like deep esoteric, you know, deep observance of, of you know, actual practice of fraternity and things like that. It's mm -hmm. only for a very small number of people. Yeah. And, and we talk about numbers a lot. And I know you guys probably feel the same way, but we can't let. I don't let numbers – to me, numbers aren't really the guideline for success. You mm -hmm. know, that's that's not – but it's, the numbers represent the, the demand for the organization. And that's – that, in my mind, is what shows yeah. the, the, what, if we're doing something right or not. So 
uh, just just for anyone that's listening, you know, we're talking about numbers a lot, but I, I wouldn't suggest, you know, that numbers are a good thing necessarily. If you're just letting uh, anybody in um, and you think that means you're a healthy lodge, that, no, I mean, you could be letting someone very toxic into your organization. Right. And, and Well, especially with the transition that masonry has taken, um, you know, the numbers that you're going to get are in the opposite direction than what you're actually looking for. So yeah, especially in today's day, day and age, I mean, that's, that's how we kind of got to the decline that we got was by going after those very numbers. Yeah. You know, I've, I've had this conversation before and uh, someone asked me at one point, you know, okay, how do we fix it? I'm in a very strange place because I'm a historian yet I'm esoteric minded. So I've got these two different uh, perspectives on it. The historic side of me, well, it kills me because I love our buildings. I, I love everything that we've accomplished and that, that stuff sticks with me. So I don't, I don't want to see the buildings go. It hurts me to see them crumble. It hurts me to see them sold. But the esoteric side of me says, you want to fix it? Okay. Scrap all your guidelines that you see today. Um, worrying about dues, worrying about buildings. I think if we could handpick the guys that we want, don't charge a dang thing, meet in a barn or a cave, you could probably have the most epic Freemasonry ever. Mm -hmm. The dues don't make the Masons, the lodges don't make the Masons, it's like-minded individuals after that sole purpose. I but agree. where we are right now, um, it, it's hard to get there, especially in a town like Gardner. You know, we're, we're a smaller town, so we're fighting to get guys in the door in the first place, um, just because we don't have as many people. The other the other difficulty we have in this particular area in Johnson County, we're in a, a big metropolitan area, Gardner being on the very edge of it, basically. But within Johnson County, we have 11 or 12 lodges within 15 minutes of each other. Yeah. And they're all struggling. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things that you're all trying to dip out of the same pot. And, you know, you get to that point where you're, you're just taking a take. Because if you don't, you die. Yeah. Double edged sword. Something, something yeah. I've always believed is that lodges need to be more fluid. And Grand Lodge structure makes it very hard. But, you know, I, I've always believed a lodge should be small, you know, no more than 30 people. When you yeah. get more than 30 active men, well, then that's when you branch out your charter and your lodge. If you have 12 lodges in one county and you have to scrape together to get a degree on, or you can't get, you know, if you can't get a people in the door to even open a degree then you need to, to merge back. And there needs to be that process where, you know, you grow when you can, and then you pull back when you need to, because nothing looks worse on a fraternity than 12, 13, 14 lodges in one county. They all look like crap because, you know, you're, everyone's spread so thin, they can't maintain it. You know, pull in, you know, you, uh, pull your resources, merge, do what you gotta do. And when you're growing and you're healthy, well, then you can look at, you know, maybe, butting out and doing something else again. And, and it's just, it's not a very popular idea for the reasons like you're talking about because everyone is partial to their lodges. They're partial to the history of the lodges and everything. And I get that, but, mm -hmm. but merging and, and, and splitting and things like that, they aren't necessarily signs of an unhealthy fraternity or anything like that. Right. If you look at, well, like the lodge that I'm a member of now, you can look at like the, the ministry in the 1900s, which as we discussed were supposedly pretty good time for Freemasonry, but just due to changes in, in society and the world getting bigger, you know, you had this, this pretty good sized community with all these little farm communities around it. And guess what? Every one of them had a lodge, but once roads started getting more well-developed, you know, everyone started getting automobiles and everything. It just made sense, you know, they, they, they merged with this with this central lodge. And no one would say that things were unhealthy at the time. I mean, this was this was during a very, what most people would view as a very healthy point in fraternity. It's just, it, it just became necessary. Yeah, from a history perspective, that's one that always kind of grinds my gears is when you get to talking or having this uh, merge conversation you'll get guys saying, well, if my lodge merged with the nearest lodge, I'd have to drive 20 more minutes to get to lodge. And, and, and being guys who've looked at a history, we know there were people riding their horseback 40 miles to get to lodge on a regular basis 
a regular so. enough basis to become past masters. And and now we got guys who are bothered by 20 extra minutes in an air conditioned 60 uh, mile an hour vehicle. Uh, so that's one that kind of grinds my gears. But uh, in line with all this, I, I, I've run a couple of studies. One was uh, pr uh, comparing county by county. Uh, this was just for Texas, but this one showed that uh, by far rural counties have a much higher per capita uh, Mason to citizen uh, number. Uh, so you, you have higher num like percentages of the population joining rural lodges, uh, which I think is interesting. I, I think that shows uh, that the rural lodges have done something to maintain relevance in their particular kind of communities that city lodges have failed to do. Uh, and uh, the other uh, study I ran, I put out a while back, it's, it's out there on, on Facebook and a couple other places, uh, was looking at some of the numbers both of y'all are talking about, uh, whether it be the dues conversation or uh, numbers. Um, and what I was looking at was national, not just uh, statewide, but nationally, the number of lodges to Masons, uh, as well as uh, the dues for the dollar's worth. Uh, and ultimately what I found was uh, shockingly uh, that since 1924 to the present day, we are currently operating about 70% of our infrastructure, looking at the number of lodges, uh, with less than 7% of the resources. Uh, and and that's, that correlates to both the number of Masons as well as the, the amount of revenue being produced by dues. Uh, and that's incredible uh, that we're even still, that, that, we're, that we are doing that. Uh, that. That ties in, I've said this before, it's mind boggling when you think about it, how well our forefathers, our Masonic forefathers, built this fraternity, mm -hmm. that they built this infrastructure that it could survive, frankly, decades of neglect mm -hmm. to still be in a viable state 40, 50, 60 years later. Now, it's on the threshold, in my opinion, where we got we to gotta wake up and do something, but that just right. speaks volumes, like what you're talking about, Robert, of, of how well they built everything, that we could run on such a, with such a minimal amount of money and manpower because it was so well they had such good foresight and it was so well made at the time the good news is all this gloom and doom the good news is there, there's signs for hope so uh there's shows like this one sprouting up there's shows like masonic improvement sprouting up uh and uh mostly being led by younger guys but you're also seeing now yeah. there's there's boomers putting out youtube videos about freemasonry yeah uh, and uh, some pretty interesting ones at that. And uh, I know the Grand Master of Kansas, that guy's popping up in videos all over the place this year. Uh, and uh, so I, I think the fraternity is kind of, uh, it, we're, we're turning a page. Uh, I think we are poised to uh, have a surge in masonry. Is it going to be numbers? Don't know. I'm, I'm not saying it's it's going to be a, the explosion in numbers everybody keeps hoping for, but we're obviously seeing an increase in Masonicons where esoteric, historic, yeah. and uh, ritualistic research uh, is being presented. Uh, you're seeing an increase in uh, an interesting number. Over the last 15 years, one age bracket has increased, and that's young men. That's, that's guys uh, that are millennials or uh, very close to that age bracket. Uh, and that tells us that there is a, an emerging uh, interest in uh, the most important people of any era, the, the young men, the people who are going to be around for the next 50 years. Uh, so uh, it's not all going to go. What's that? If we don't drop the ball. That's right. Uh, if we don't drop the ball. That's a great point. Well, in uh, efforts to start bringing it home, guys, we're going to send it around and uh, kind of wrap it up with some final thoughts. Um, Brother Justin, go ahead and start with you. Uh, sure. Uh, final thought. I want to. I want to touch on what I just said with Robert. If we don't drop yeah. the ball, if you look, if you do any kind of research, like it's not even necessarily research. There's a growing trend, and, and this is going to sound dorky, but I'm going to bring it around. There's a growing trend in young men and men my age. You know, kind of getting up there compared to Robert, 
but we're, we're looking in there's there's these websites that are sprouting up you know like art of manliness and order mm-hmm. and these these basically it's how to become a better man and i'm not going to go blame anyone you know any generations on this but you have this these young men who are looking they're craving this kind of mentorship they're looking for how to actually go about becoming better men. What was used yeah. to be a very obvious process, there used to be men in the community that were obvious. You had, you had cultural icons and heroes that made it very clear what was expected of you to be a man. It's so ambiguous now. And you have these young guys looking for these things. And this is, in my opinion, what makes Freemasonry so relevant today is because it offers a framework and a guideline on how to not just become a, a, a man but a better man and it gives you the opportunity to surround yourself kind of like a like a, yeah. like a iron council you know of, of stronger of, of good men you know what's the what's the what's the scripture uh, iron sharpens iron you know and so it, like a, it's like a mastermind group and that's where that's where we as freemasons that's where the demand is that's where we have to catch that ball before we drop it. We have to, when these young men join, this is what we have to offer. We have to, we have to mentor them. We have to teach them, you know, and, and it, you don't have to create any new kind of information or anything because really everything you'll learn about Freemasonry, all the questions and answers, the lectures, they lay out what it takes to be a man and how to improve. All, you, all we have to do is actually teach people these things. And we got them because now we're offering what we're looking for. And that's what I was looking for without even knowing it. Because a lot of these guys will come without realizing that's what they're looking for. But that's what I was looking for when I was coming in. And if people had, if I had been sat down and shown these things, it builds a, it builds a, and I'm not saying young men have to be spoon fed, but if there's some kind of actual educational program that's actually teaching these guys these things, your gold and Freemasonry will go on for generations to come. As long as you can, as long as you, well, maybe not generations to come, you know, we got to, we got to adapt to the times. Obviously I'm talking about something different than what our forefathers are looking for, but we have to, we have to start ad- adapting these practices to the generation and teach them these things. Definitely. And I, I guess I'll go next just so I can kind of piggyback off of what you said there. Um, yeah. I mean, that that's phenomenal. And, this generation basically looking for that, that guidance and that, that wanting to be better men, it really does. It comes down to that mentorship aspect. And, you know, I'll, I'll put it out there that any, anyone that I refer to as my mentor is not someone that just helped me learn the ritual. The mm. ones that I refer to as ritual or as, as my mentors are ones that not only help me in lodge, but have taken the time to help me in life. Mm-hmm. And I have a few of those individuals that I will term as my mentors and none of those, I mean, uh, one of those never helped me with any, I've never, I've never uh, belonged to the same lodge as he has. I've sat in lodge with him, but it's more that mentorship on that deeper level. And, you know, it, it really kind of brings me back to the fact, cause we've, we've talked before about, um, you know, internet masonry or, you know, doing without the lodge buildings, without the dues and all that. Um, well, then, then why come? You know, if, if you're not getting what you're looking for in Lodge, why are you still there? Well, you know, that's a good question. Why do you still go to Lodge? And I think it really comes back to something in just that aspect is you're still taking away something from those guys there. Something's still drawing you back. It may not be the, the ritual or the Masonic-esque um, that you think you're looking for, but you're finding other value there in some which way. And I know that because we have one guy at our lodge that really doesn't get all that much in to the ritual side of it. He does great at it. He's just not that into it. And I've asked him before, well, so why do you come? He goes, I just love these freaking guys. They make my life better. You know, well, you can't cut them down for that, can you? If you ask, yeah. if you ask any Mason, what was your, what was your favorite Masonic experience? No one is going to say, man, I read this book six years ago, changed my life. No, they're going to talk about, man, I sat down with, with Robert and Alex and we, we had a, we had a two hour talk and it was like the best experience of my life. Or I went to this lodge and they, they, they conferred this 
amazing degree, or we went out for, for drinks after, and we just had these great conversations. It's the human interaction that you cannot yeah. replace. Does it? I mean, reading's great. Research online is great. You know, watching videos is great. Podcasts, they, it's all supplemental, but it supplements one-on-one or human face-to-face -face interaction. And that, yeah. you can never do away with that. That's, that's why for masonry, it, it's, that's why we still do it the way we do it because that is the heart of, of, of everything right there. Yeah, no, uh, totally. And I mean, you know, to tie it into the historical aspect, we see that go so far back uh, to bring up Pike again, you know, him working with Mackey. Um, just, you see that so much through that, that want and desire for that mentorship um, to kind of mold you, chip away at your rough ashlar, so to speak, um, and kind of take you on to the next level. So, yeah. Robert? Uh, yeah, this is good stuff. Uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, I agree with both of you. Uh, uh, that, that human interaction, as Justin put it, is, is crucial. Uh, if just going out researching and writing or reading about this stuff was enough, then Manly P. Hall would have never become a Mason. Uh, uh, so here's a guy who spent a, a significant portion of his life researching esotericism and history of fraternities such as ours and obviously got something out of it because he kept doing it but then he became a mason because he was missing something uh whether he got that or not th th there's a there's a lesson therein that one of the most famous esoteric writers of the 20th century uh was already one of the most famous esoteric writers of the 20th century and then became a mason and it's because this human interaction is so uh important uh as far as uh, what we're doing with these numbers, whether they're low or high or whatever they are at any time, uh, there's an important question we have to ask ourselves as lodges. Are we making Masons or are we making good men better? Because uh, if all you're doing is making Masons, you're wasting everybody's time. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to be making good men better. And uh, I've seen three di or two different uh, uh, approaches to understanding the ways you can do that. One was from an Indiana Grandmaster that it, I think of it every day because it makes so much sense to me. He said, you've got young Masons, you've got middle-aged Masons, and you've got old Masons. And he wasn't talking about how many years you've been on the earth. He was talking about how many years you've been in Masonry. And he said, the young Masons, the new Masons, whether they're 20 or 70, they want education. They came, they came here because they want to learn what Masonry is and how it's going to make them better. They want education. They're going to uh, be the biggest proponents of your education programs. Uh, your middle-aged Masons want to see a well-run organization. They want to see officers fulfilling their duties. They want to see the lodge hitting on all of the points that it's supposed to hit on as an organization. Uh, and, and your old-age Masons want fellowship. Uh, they want uh, to spend time with uh, like-minded or even not so like-minded guys and have uh, courteous discourse uh, in either case. Uh, so if you can hit on all three of those, education, well-run organization, and fellowship, you're going to be hitting on all three types of that Indiana Grandmasters uh, aged Masons. The other three types of Masons, which kind of actually gives a pretty good parallel to that, I got this, I think, originally from uh, Rip Moore uh, out of Fort Worth and the Fort Worth 148 podcast. Uh, he, he identified three kinds of Masons that I have caught myself doing with every Mason I meet now. Uh, there are esotericists, ritualists, and fraternalists, uh, which again kind of correlates to those three categories already laid out. But your esotericists are going to be your your manly pee hall, Kabbalah, uh, what's the real meaning behind the meaning of the ritual type of guy, uh, which I'm prone to at times. Uh, and uh, then your ritualists are going to be your memory work guys. They're going to be your word for word uh, guys who uh, they may not care why some part of the ritual is what it is, but they want to see it done well. They want to see it word perfect, steps in the right place at the right time, uh, and, and same thing for the organization. They want to see it run well. Uh, and you're fraternalists, and those are the guys who, regardless of age, he may be 20, he may be 50, uh, but he wants to hang out with the bros. He wants to do cigars and whiskey. Uh, he wants to uh, have fun and uh, uh if you can hit on all three cylinders, you got a healthy lodge. Yeah. 
So to, to kind of touch on what you said there, that, that, was a, that was a pretty powerful comment. Is your lodge making masons or is it making better men? Uh, you know, it's, it's one of those cliche um, phrases that we throw out there a whole lot, making good men better. Um, you know, masonry gets guilty of that. We, we throw out uh, slogans all the time, but do we act upon it? Uh, you know, we're talking about the mentorship and like uh, you said earlier, Robert, what are you putting into the man versus what you put into it, you get out of it. What are you putting into them? That's, that's a really powerful way to think of it. Um, so yeah, I, I think, uh, this was a great topic. I really appreciate you guys delving into it with us. Um, brother Justin, I want to give you a, a moment to throw in some plugs, um, how to find you and everything. But before we do wrap up with that, um, Brother Robert, you had a pretty cool artifact you showed us in the green room before the show, and I want to give you a chance to share that on here. Sure. Shout out to brothers Daniel Gardner and Joseph Wages for uh, uh, prodding me and helping make this addition to the collection possible, but uh, there it is. This is a uh, pewter stein. Uh, it's got a date on it that says 1784. This is right there. Well, you can see it. Uh, I feel like this is becoming a running thing on this show now, me doing a really bad job of showing things up close. Uh, I will say that based on the mark inside the lid, I don't necessarily think it was made in 1784. I think it was made in the 18-teens or 20s by a silversmith named, uh, I think it was Perry. Uh, but uh, it was commemorating some kind of organization anniversary or something along those lines. And, of course, the coolest part, the reason we're even talking about it, uh, you can see there the old school square encompasses that was quite popular in the late 1700s and early 1800s and some sort of uh, maybe an early uh, Templar, Masonic Templar, I should say, important distinction, uh, cross. Uh, so... Uh, there's uh, my new uh, festive board cup. Yeah. Cool. Nice. Well, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Always love to see some old pewter. Never gets old. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brother Justin, we're going to hand it over to you. If uh, you want to throw in some shameless plugs, how can people get a hold of you, uh, find you, and uh, see your content on the internet? Sure thing. I try to be all over the place. You can find me on uh, Facebook. Of course, uh, just search for Masonic Improvement. You can find me on YouTube, uh, YouTube backslash Masonic Improvement. Uh, my website is MasonicImprovement.com. Uh, check it out. I also uh, am on Instagram. Same thing, Masonic Improvement. Uh, yeah, pretty much any social media medium, if you type in Masonic Improvement, I have some kind of presence on there. Uh, I really encourage everybody to like like Facebook or Instagram, but I'm more active on Facebook. I post a lot of things that just, for whatever reason, they don't show up on blogs or on, on videos, but there, we have a very healthy activity on Facebook. So I encourage anyone that's on there, uh, give it a like, follow, check it out. Wonderful. Well, we want to thank you again for coming on today. I think we had a really lively chat. I know I enjoyed it. I hope everyone out there watching enjoyed it and took something away from it. Um, I would ask you all to contemplate um, several of the topics that we talked about tonight, but that one that's really sticking to me is uh, instead of you get out of it what you put into it, what are you putting into them? Uh, contemplate that. Take it back to your lodge and uh, spread that around. See what happens with it. But with that, until next time, I encourage you guys to check out the group on Facebook. That is the Historical Light Masonic Research Group on Facebook. We will continue the conversation there. And until next time, keep preserving the light. Have a great day.